Hello, family. Happy Palm Sunday. Like for some of y'all, you're saying happy what day? Listen, I grew up celebrating Palm Sunday. It was a big deal in my house. But the reason why is not because it's just on the calendar, but because of what it represents. It reminds us of the very thing that the Apostle Paul was desperately trying to get the church at Galatia to understand. That through Christ, through Jesus, we now get to be a part of a new covenant. We get to be a part of a new family, God's family, and we get new life. That all these things we get by faith when we trust in him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, as we continue to read through your word, continue to study your word, that you would continue to make yourself known. I pray that you would open our ears, that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds so that we will understand, comprehend, and obey your truth. Let us grab a hold of it today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, Palm Sunday was a big deal. You see, it was a promise of the Messiah coming. And up until this point in time, people had ideas, people had thoughts, and they would say this, and they would say that, and Jesus is kind of allowed it. And it was only among a handful of people, the close disciples that knew who Jesus was. But Palm Sunday was when Jesus was letting the cat, cat out of the bag. Like, listen, this is who I am. It was prophesied about my arrival. And they were so excited. And they were like, our king has come. And they were so ready for him to step in and reign and rule. Overthrow Rome, let's go. The challenge was they were looking at Jesus, but they didn't see the mode of transportation he was on. He was riding on a donkey. And kings don't ride donkeys when they're coming to conquer. Look at it through history. They ride a horse. And we know that our king is going to come again, and he will be riding a horse. And when he does, friends, it's game over. And I'm looking forward to that day because it means we finally won. Our king, our God, will put all of his enemies under his foot. That day is an important day, but we have hope that that day is coming because of Palm Sunday. Because it was prophesied that he would come riding on a donkey and it's prophesied that he's going to come again riding on a horse. And because he came the first time, I can trust and believe he's going to come the second. And when he does, oh man, I'm excited. It means all the naysayers, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. But we get to get in on it, not forced to bow, but willfully bow. And this is the very thing that Paul is inviting us to when he's talking to the church at Galatia. He's saying, listen, choose how you're going to worship God. Are you going to worship him as one under the law? Or are you going to worship him as one saved by faith? And you choose. In Galatians 4, 21, tell me you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Before it is written that Abraham had two sons. Now we're going to do quite a bit of reading and I want you to grab a hold and we'll explain, but listen to what he's about to say. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, a slave, and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. And we'll talk about what happened. And he of the free woman through the promise. In which things are symbolic for these are the two covenants the one from mount sinai remember moses received the law mount sinai 400 plus years after abraham in which gave birth to bondage to hagar it's saying listen the law helped us understand that man there's this thing called sin that we have as a problems all over us and the law helped us understand how sinful we were for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which is now and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. <laughs> it's saying, listen, these, these two ladies that Abraham had a relationship with, he was married to Sarai. And Sarai was old and couldn't have any children. And Abraham was even older and couldn't have any kids. But he had this promise from God saying, look up at the stars, so shall your descendants be. Look at the sand. And he's looking over going, man, I got all this wealth. Like, 
the amount of wealth he had will blow your mind. Listen, Forbes couldn't keep up. He was super wealthy, crazy wealthy. And he was like, I'm going to have to give this to like a servant, like somebody else, one of my servants in my own house. He says, no, you're going to have a child. You're going to leave this to your child. And, and as time was going on, they were getting impatient. And Sarah's like, listen, I'm, I love you, Abraham. You love me. But the reality is my body's not producing life. And so maybe God wants us to take matters into our own hand. And remember that little stint, that whole situation when Pharaoh tried to take me as his wife. And when he realized, ha, ah, you were actually, you know, my husband, he set me free and he gave me a bunch of gifts. And some of those gifts were these slaves and one of them being Hagar. Listen, I've been watching her work. She pretty strong. She probably fertile. You go have a baby with her. And I will raise that child as my own. Very common in that day. And Abraham's like, ah, oh, well, maybe. And they follow through on this plan of flesh. And as this child is born, all of a sudden there becomes some animosity. It's like something you see in a modern day show. Like, hey, what's happening here? Like, you know, here's this woman that's the wife. And now this lady is a concubine. Like, what just happened? And, and the lady who was pregnant with the baby starts looking at her master and thinking, you know what? You might be the lady of the house, but he can't. I'm carrying his child. And it was a mess. And so Sarah is like, listen, nah, enough of this. I, she got to go. Her and her child. No, I want no part of this. The Lord comes back and says, listen, that was your plan, Abraham. And at the time, his name was Abram. He says, I haven't forgotten my plan. I still plan to bring forth life because I want you to know that it is me. Stop trusting in your own will. Stop trusting in your flesh, in your mind, in your ability. But trust me, the child of promise is going to come through that woman, that wife, Sarai, who is, the Bible says her womb was as good as dead. It's going to come through her womb so that you know that nothing's impossible for God. And Abraham believed and it was accounted as righteousness. And that child that was born, the first with Hagar, Ishmael, the second born with Sarai, was Isaac. And the name means laughter. And she laughs out loud when she has this child because she's like, I'm an old lady. And the Lord has given me this privilege of being a mother. And it's through this child that the promise has been fulfilled. That's why forever God has chosen to be known by a name that is just remarkable. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is awesome. Like our God has a new name that he gave himself. So powerful. And these guys are not dead. They're all alive. So powerful. And he's saying, hey, listen, in this picture, you can choose to be like the slave woman and try to do your own thing in your flesh, but you have no part of the promise if you do, or you can choose to be saved by faith. Are you going to go through your plan like Abraham and Sarah and, and Hagar came up with this thing? Or are you going to trust God's plan? And ultimately, God being so kind because Abraham cried out about the older boy, about Ishmael. What about him? He said, listen, I heard you. I got you. I'm going to make him a great nation, too. He's going to have 12 sons and princes. And, and listen, they're going to be a very famous people. But my promise of the heir, speaking of the Messiah, the one who fulfilled the promise when he was riding on this donkey and then a week later fulfilled it when he died on the cross and then three days later fulfilled it by actually not staying dead. He said, no one takes my life, I lay it down. We celebrate because our God said it and he did it. And we're looking forward to the fact that Jesus next time, not riding on no donkey. He coming riding on a horse. But our choice is, are we going to be under the law or are we going to be saved by faith? The second thing that Paul is like, hey, listen, you either going to be born of the flesh, like they came up with that plan and you got this child that guy's like, that, come on, guys, that's not the, the, the stars. Remember, I, I'm capable. I made that. I can produce life. 
in a womb that can't sustain life because I am life. You're going to be born of the flesh, your idea, your plan, or you're going to be born of the spirit. In Galatians 4.27, for it is written, rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him, we preceded him, no, excuse me, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. He's saying, listen, these two promises are at war with each other. But this, this prophetic word that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, when he says, Come, you who are desolate, this woman who was cast out and doesn't have a husband and doesn't have any kids and feels so alone and feels so persecuted by the other house full of kids, house full of sinful desires, house full of man's plans, ideas of man. But this other was representing the nation of Israel. And the reason why she was out there in the wilderness was because she turned her heart away from her husband. She wasn't faithful to him. She broke his heart. And as a result, he said, fine, you want to go, go. And this was God speaking about his relationship with the nation of Israel. But he's telling the, the prophet Isaiah, listen, right now she's about to go into captivity. She's about to go and it breaks my heart. But, but this is what she's wanted to do. I've come after her again and again and said, wear my ring, my covenant. I love you. And again and again, she said, no, thank you. And she kept chasing after this God, after this people, after this sinful thing. And he's like, ah, breaks my heart. Fine. Then God took his hand off of them and all these enemies came in and began to destroy his bride. And it broke his heart. But then God tells the prophet, she's going to cry back out to me. She's going to realize how much I love her. She's going to remember who I am and I remember who she is. And I remember how much I love her. And I'm going to come after her. And I'm going to deal with those people who persecuted her. I'm going to deal with those who work according to the flesh. And my son is going to come in the power of my spirit. And he's going to overthrow those works. And at that point in time, she won't be my bride born of flesh, but she'll be my bride born of spirit. And the Apostle Paul is saying something so powerful that this was being made mention to the nation of Israel. But now by faith, it's now including us, us Gentiles, us non-Jews, that both our Jewish brothers and sisters and us collectively get to be a part of this promise. And we get in on it by faith that God wants his family to be so big, so huge. He wants his family to include all of us. This is why it says God desires that none be lost. This is why it says, for God so loved the world. And because he was looking for his bride, he wanted his bride, not just the nation of Israel. He wants her, but all nations and that collectively we would come. And it talks about it so beautifully in Revelation. Jesus is called the bridegroom and we are called the bride of Christ. This is the very thing Paul is trying to get them to understand that right now you are walking unfaithfully towards your husband towards your God by going and choosing to go at it your way. You can't love your spouse on your terms. Hey, you know what? I think we need to have some space. No, you love according to God's terms and God's terms are perfect. <laughs> but the third thing, this is so powerful, is we have the opportunity to choose to be in bondage or in true freedom that it's really a choice that God has for us. It's like a beautiful bird that finds refuge in a cage with the door wide open. This cage is here for you to protect you. There's food for you, but the door is wide open. If you don't leave and come and leave and come, it's because you chose not to, but it's not meant to be a place that traps you. And often people leave the comfort of being with God and they walk in bondage. Galatians 4.30 says it this way. Nevertheless, what does scripture say? It says, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free, man, free woman. 
So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. He is saying, listen, you need to choose today. Are you going to be a son or daughter by faith? Or are you going to try to get to God on your terms? It's been said that religion is man's way to try to get to God. If I just do this, if I just do that, or worse still, so many people that says there is no God, I'll do my own thing. I'm God. I'll worship myself, gratifying my flesh. Well, friends, listen, <laughs> the Bible tells us clearly you've got nothing coming. And you know, like I know inside of us, this body is awful temporary. And the older I get, the more temporary it feels. And the more I'm excited about what's to come. That listen, in Genesis, it tells us that God built for six days, day one, day two, day three, four, five, six. And then what did he do on the seventh day? He rested. But what I'm excited about is Jesus is riding on that donkey, was letting us know the very thing Jesus said. I'm working on this Sabbath because my father is working and Jesus right now is working. And this time he's not building no chairs as a carpenter, but he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you that our God right now ain't resting. No, not at all. We are preparing ourselves to be with him. He busy working, I'm busy working. I'm getting ready to be with him. I'm getting ready to enjoy being a part of his family. And friends, I wanna help you do the same. That whether you live on this earth for a hundred years or, or whether your time is, is up, we are preparing ourselves to be a part of that new covenant in God's new family and his new life. So what's the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message? Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, as the Apostle Paul is urging us and reminding us to choose to be a part of God's family, that Jesus has come wedding ring in hand saying, will you be mine? And I pray that my brothers and sisters will say yes, that we will accept your invitation and we would receive it by faith, that we would enjoy, Father, the new covenant that was established by Jesus, that we would receive, God, your invitation to be a part of your family, and that we would even now begin to walking in the new life that you have purchased with your own blood, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, I love you and I'm looking forward to connecting with you all next week for Easter. And don't forget, if you want to go deep, if you've got questions, reach out to us or come hang out with us on Sundays at 9 a.m. We meet over Zoom and we go deep into the word of God. You have questions. God has plenty of answers and we want to come alongside you to help you discover them. God bless you and can't wait to connect with you all next week.